so many times we cry out for justice. Man, I tell you what, when someone has done us wrong, we wonder why God doesn't punish them. Why doesn't God get them? Why doesn't God give them what they deserve? Well, one thing you have to understand, dear friend, is that we want mercy from God. And I have to remember this, is whenever my enemies, whenever they falsely accuse me and turn against me, I want God to treat them with mercy because I want God to be merciful because I want God to treat me with mercy. So when I think about someone, here's what I would encourage you to think about. The next time someone mistreats you, so the next time that someone falsely accuses you, the next time someone slanders you, do you want God to treat them the same way that he treats you? Do you want God to treat them with mercy? Do you want God to treat you with mercy? I am glad today that God does not give us what we deserve, but he gives us grace and he gives us mercy. We are reading a treatise on affliction or treatise of affliction. It's kind of put both ways many times and I kind of get them all confused. By Thomas Case, 17th century Puritan pastor. And man, he is laying down some great stuff as we make our way through these readings. And here we are today. Number four says affliction reveals God's mercy. First, there is mercy in the moderation of our sufferings. Even in judgment, God remembers mercy. That's Habakkuk chapter three and verse two. I mean, like we gotta realize this, that we're not getting what we deserve. We really stop and think about this. This is what Thomas Case is pushing us into, is that even whenever we are being disciplined in love, we're still not getting what we deserve. God is still showing us mercy. When God says that his church has received double for her sins, Isaiah chapter 40, verse two, the church responds, no, Lord, you have, not pun you, have, you have punished us less than our sins deserve. Ezra chapter nine and verse 13. God may say he has given too much, but the church says it is too little. It's a blessed sight to see God and the soul contending in this way. The church in Babylon cried, it is for the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fell not, recognizing that their exile could have been much worse. They were in Babylon, but they could have been in hell. It is purely because of God's mercy that they weren't destroyed. The afflicted soul feels the same, acknowledging that any suffering on this side of hell it is pure mercy. Man, that is good. I mean, like what Thomas Cakes is saying is that we got to understand something. We got to frame this in the point that we, our sins, because of our sins, we deserve hell. So anything short of that, that's a demonstration of God's mercy. Second, there is mercy in support. When we think we can't bear our afflictions, God's mercy holds us up. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Like David, when we are sinking, God puts his everlasting arms beneath us, just as Christ reached out to save Peter from drowning. Even when we don't feel ecstatic joy, we still find sweet support. He le his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. This support is not just a feeling, but being upheld, but often includes God's refreshing and comforting. Mercy, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. That's Psalms chapter 94 and verse 19. When dark and despairing thoughts overwhelm us, God's comfort brings light and joy to our souls. This comfort lifts us out of our despair, turning our internal hell into a heaven. In prosperity, we hear about God's mercy, but in affliction, we truly taste it. We experience such delight that we can call to others, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is why the Apostle Paul chose to rejoice in his sufferings, saying, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. He found joy in Christ's suffering for him and in his suffering for Christ. Number five. The all-sufficiency of God is another attribute he shows his suffering people. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh, God told Moses in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 1. Moses had seen what Pharaoh did to Israel 
Now he would see what God could do to Pharaoh. When their burdens doubled, their bondage ended. The same waters that were rocks for Israel became graves for the Egyptians. Hmm. The proud Pharaoh boasted, I will pursue, overtake, divide the spoil, satisfy my lust, draw my sword, destroy them. That's Exodus chapter 15, verse 9. But God's response was swift. You blew with your wind and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 10. Pharaoh and his boasts were drowned. God appeared to oppress Israel at the perfect moment. In the thing they dealt proudly, God was above them. Israel saw the great work and the Lord did that the Lord did on the Egyptians, and they feared the Lord and believed in him and his servant Moses. Prosperity hides God's works, but affliction opens our eyes. When we see our dangers, we can also see God's deliverance. When you think about this, that God led the nation of Israel, it says, the Bible says in Exodus, said in a roundabout way, right into this cul-de-sac, this trap, there's, a, there's mountains behind them, and the Red Sea in front of them, and there's Pharaoh's army, the most powerful army of all time, bearing down on them. So what does God do? I mean, in that moment, they must be thinking, man, God brought us out here to end us. But that's where the greatest deliverance came. That's where the Red Sea parted, and God led them across on dry ground, and then that turned into the grave and destroyed Pharaoh's army. Man, I tell you what, that's good stuff that Thomas Case is leading us through here today. God could have led Israel to the promised land in 40 days, but instead he led them through the wilderness in 40 years. This was to show that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out from the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Israel learned more about God's all-sufficiency in the wilderness than they would have in the land of plenty. They saw that God could feed them without bread and quench their thirst without streams. He can make the clouds rain food and rocks give water. While creatures can do nothing without God, he can do anything without them. Suffering times reveal God's attributes. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. That's Psalms chapter 9 and verse 9. Those who know his name will trust in him. That's Psalms chapter 9 and verse 10. In the school of affliction, God teaches his people about his attributes through visible lessons. Many people learn more about God through a few months of suffering than through many years of sermons. So think about that, dear friend. Which one would you rather have? Would you rather have, I mean, just right here where we end right here. Which one, a few months of suffering or would you rather have many years of sermons? You learn more through a few months of suffering. I mean, like if we had our choice, man, I mean, most of us, we, we wouldn't say, man, a few months of suffering, that is rough few weeks, a few days of suffering. Man, that's, that's, a, that's a little too much for me. But God knows what we need. We know what we want, but God knows what we need. Now, we want the sugary snacks right here and right now. We want to do what we want to do, go our own way, do our own thing. And God is trying to save us from ourselves. Man, I tell you what, when I finally learned that lesson, that God is trying to save me from myself, I became much more appreciative, much more thankful for his loving discipline, for the pain that guides me in the right direction, for the pain that reveals the wickedness of my heart, the deception of those around me, but the purity of my heavenly father. I became very thankful for that because really what it comes down to, the most important thing is your relationship with God. The most important thing that Jesus said is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness first above everything else. That is what's most important.